If you will bring out what is within you, then what is within you will save you. If you will not bring out what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. Well, I felt that my story would be a kind of through line, and I told the stories of a number of other people and their experiences of depression, and I thought if I'm going to ask those people to be honest about their experience, I need to be honest about my own experience. It seemed like it was the prerequisite. But to me, it was also the story of all of these people's evolving relationship to their own depression. And in fact, I'm still in touch with all of the central characters. And recently, for an article, I got in touch with all of them and said, how are you doing? Um, and now, some years after the original publication, and got everybody's updates. Some are doing very well. A few are struggling to a greater extent. I really felt that the, um, that the narrative, had, it had to be a story. It had to be something that would be engaging to read. It shouldn't be turgid and dense, and it should be philosophical in an embracing sense rather than in an exclusionary, um, exclusionary sense. But I also felt as I got all of these stories, which are very different, some of them are stories of people who have many opportunities, some who have fewer, some people who responded very quickly to treatment, some people who really have, um, uh, have not responded as well. Um, as I tried to look at all of those stories, I wanted to look at an honest examination of their struggles, but the final chapter of the book is called Hope, and I wanted to look at how I had arrived at a point of actually, I think, having quite a good life, despite having had this condition to deal with, and I wanted to look at how other people had made their way to those good lives, and I hoped that by telling the stories of people I admired, rather than the stories of people um, that I, um, I pitied, um, that, that I would end up being able to help others to admire those they knew who were fighting the condition, but also to find the, the resilience within themselves for it. So it's, it's a story. Um, I mean, you can see me now sitting here. Obviously, I'm not in the grips of an acute depression now. I've just been quite open and told you that I was in the grips of an acute depression. I feel like hearing over and over and over again the story that this is a condition that can be treated, um, uh, that, that that is, uh, there's no end to the importance of that narrative, but it is a narrative. And, you know, I, it's something I continue to manage. I continue to take medication for it. I probably will for the rest of my life. Um, it takes some doing, but the fact that it takes some doing hasn't cut me off from these exhilarating experiences and this, um, this joyful life. I would have had an easier life if I were straight, but I would not be me. And I now think that I like being me better than I like the idea of being someone else. Someone who, of course, I have neither the option of being um, nor even the ability fully to, um, to imagine. But if you banish the dragons, you banish the heroes. And we become attached to the heroic strain in our own lives. When I was perhaps six years old, I went with my mother and my brother to a shoe store in New York. And after we had gotten our shoes fitted, the salesman told us that we could each have a balloon to take home. And my brother wanted a red balloon, and I wanted a pink balloon. And my mother said that she thought, I'd really rather a, a blue balloon. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I really wanted the pink balloon. And she reminded me that my favorite color was blue. <laughs> the fact that my favorite color now is blue but I'm still gay, <laughs> will give you some evidence, I think, of a mother's influence and its limits. When I tell that story about my mother and the pink balloon, it's really a story about my mother thinking that by getting me to take a different balloon, she could change the underlying fact that was in question. I was six years old. I thought for some reason we were talking about these pieces of rubber that floated on a string, and that that was the be all and end all of it. But in fact, we were talking about something much more fundamental. And, um, and I found the efforts um, and the pressure I felt, not only from my parents, but from the society around me to change, I found it very difficult um, and very, um, very toxic much of the time. But I also, when I was little, had dyslexia, which is a learning disability. And my mother worked very closely with me on resolving my dyslexia. And it was largely resolved. When I entered school, my parents were told by my teachers that I would never learn to read or write. 
I've had many problems in life, and that is not one of them. Um, <laughs> and so I think the fact that there was the possibility of making that fundamental change um, led to the idea that anything that seemed somehow unsatisfactory could be changed. And the negotiation, in a way, of my childhood, um, and to some degree even my adulthood, is this constant pondering, what to change, what to keep the same. When I was in second grade, which is to say seven years old at school, Bobby Finkel um, had a birthday party and invited everyone in the class but me. Um, my mother assumed that there had been a mistake, and so she called Mrs. Finkel, and Mrs. Finkel said that Bobby didn't like me, and he didn't want me at his birthday party. And uh, on the day of his birthday party, she took me out for um, a trip to the zoo and a hot fudge sundae, and tried to make it into a little celebration of our own. And I sometimes think it was that moment with Bobby Finkel's birthday, when I really first understood I was different from the other kids, and they didn't like it very much. I certainly, at that point, didn't have the vocabulary to say what that difference was. I didn't know what it meant to be gay. I don't think I'd ever even heard the word. Um, but I knew I was different, and I knew that it wasn't going to be so easy to endure. And the, the nature of the difficulty changed, but the difficulty itself persists. Uh, when I was 13, um, I was on a school bus that went from um, my house to school um, with lots of other kids. Um, and one of the kids who was on the school bus came up with the nickname Percy, which he thought was a good nickname for the fact that I had a less than masculine demeanor. Um, I had sort of funny glasses, and I uh, was awkward, and I walked strangely, and I was very unathletic. And um, sometimes he and his cohort would chant that taunt the entire length of that school bus ride, which was 45 minutes in each direction. And I would sit there while they said, Percy, 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 over and over and over again. They eventually put a chaperone on the bus to see to it that this kind of thing didn't happen, and the taunting stopped. But I still got called faggot all the time at school often with an earshot of teachers, teachers who did absolutely nothing about it. The next year, our science teacher told us in the course of class that all um, gay men developed fecal incontinence because gay sex destroyed their anal sphincter. And everyone just sat and accepted these prejudiced, dark comments being given in the context of classroom teaching. I ended up graduating from high school without ever visiting the school cafeteria because I felt if I had gone, I would have sat with the girls and been laughed at for doing so, or sat with the boys and been laughed at for being the sort of boy who should sit with the girls. And I really struggled um, in those experiences. I had my friends, I had my circle at school, um, and I had some real successes. I had the lead part in the um, school play, um, I sang in our school choir, which rather curiously for the time toured Romania in 1980. Um, and uh, uh, so I made my way through. Um, but um, uh, I spent my time trying to avoid taunts from the guys who called me Percy um, when I could avoid them and enduring those taunts when I couldn't. And I didn't understand then that avoidance and endurance might be the gateway to meaning. I then went on to work on a book about depression, and I looked at the fact that actually the people who are trying to keep their depression secret are frequently the ones who suffer with it the most, um, because they are the most lonely, in the same way that for me, as perhaps for some of you, being in the closet as a gay person had been a very lonely experience. Um, and then I began researching um, rates of depression in various communities. And I started looking particularly at depression among gay people, which is astronomically and terrifyingly high. And I thought, why should there be so much depression in the gay community? I'll read you a few statistics. Um, in one study, researchers looked at middle-aged twins, one of whom was gay and one of whom was straight. Among the straight, about 4% had attempted suicide. And among the gay ones, 15% had attempted suicide. 
Another study did a random population sampling of almost 4,000 men between the ages of 17 and 39. 3.5% of heterosexuals had attempted suicide, and almost 20% of the people who had same-sex partners had attempted suicide. That my people and the community I belong to has this high rate of suicide, this high rate of depression, this high rate of despair. And I thought it's not anything that's organically linked to having, uh, being attracted to people of the same gender as yourself. That's not where it comes from. It's something that's linked to the constant feeling of inadequacy that gets imposed on gay people. And I thought if we recognize that depression is an epidemic, that that despair is something which is undermining our society. The World Health Organization has said that there is more use, uh, more loss of useful life years to depression than to any other condition. That we need to address the root of that depression. And if one of the places where that depression runs the highest is in the gay community, we need to figure out why that's happening and change our society, not only because it's kind and humane, but also because it's in the economic and emotional interests of the mainstream not to have this large segment of the population mired in pain and depression and sadness. I've been asked on several occasions um, about the uh, question of uh, depression as an identity and the depression of being gay as an identity and how they're similar and how they're different. And um, I, uh, I've said consistently that being depressed is painful because depression is inherently painful. It's a very unpleasant experience and it will always be an unpleasant experience because its defining characteristic is the psychic pain that it causes. Being gay is difficult because of the social prejudice that surrounds gay people. And if you are able fully to lift that social prejudice, then the difficulty of being gay would be resolved. And I firmly believe that that's the case. Has there been progress? Yes, there's been tremendous progress. Um, I, when I was a child, being gay was a crime, it was an illness, and it was a sin. And in my adult life, it's an identity. And um, I don't want to say take over uh, an enormously long time explaining my own whole history, but for me, when I was younger, I despaired about being gay. And I suspect that it was my deep unhappiness about being gay that, um, uh, that ultimately led me into, um, into my depression, or at least it was one of the factors that led me into it, the difficulties that had been associated with it. And I grew up thinking that if I was gay, I would be alone, and I would certainly never have children, and uh, that I would never be invited into the social milieu that my parents had inhabited. And of course, when one is growing up, one thinks one's parents' social milieu is the only one one should aspire to. So, um, and now I've had this uh, experience as an adult. I am uh, married to John. We've been together now for 13 years. Um, I uh, have uh, children uh, who we're bringing up together. Uh, we have just enrolled those children in school in New York. Um, we've been warmly welcomed to every place that we've gone. So things have changed. Um, and things have changed in ways that were really unimaginable when I was little. And the fact that they could change from a time when these things were unimaginable in the society I live in makes me feel certain that it's possible for them to change in a like fashion in other societies and elsewhere um, around the world. Um, you know, why are gay people depressed? Because they fear being alone, or because they are alone, because they wanted to have a family and discover that they won't be able to, because they experience social exclusion, um, because of all of the anxiety that's associated with thinking, oh, when the next person finds out, what will they think, or what will they say, or what will they do? Um, and it comes up over and over and over again, and it comes up in America too. In the first place, America is divided regionally, and the acceptance of gay relationships is primarily um, in, the, um, uh, in the coasts and in the northern part of the country, and is not set in uh, to the same degree in the south, that we're beginning to see a little bit of progress there. 
it also varies you know, from family to family, from household to household. There are parents um, uh, uh, who are able to celebrate their children and parents who are not. And uh, I, think, um, I think that as we reach a society in which we less and less stigmatize being gay, um, that we will have more and more people who, um, who are able to lead these better lives. And in a strange way, and I'm only thinking of this parallel now because of this particular conversation, but in the same way that I said to you that um, uh, providing treatment for depression um, among uh, the indigent benefits not only the people who are treated, but also the society at large. I firmly believe that having a more open and tolerant society in which gay people aren't being driven to alcoholism and suicide and self-destruction makes for a better world and a better society for everyone else too. There are a lot of gay people who have a lot to give to the world, and a lot of them have been prevented from doing it by um, and the exclusion that they experience. And I deeply believe that in the same way that we need a diversity of species on the planet in order to sustain, um, in order to sustain this, the systems of the world, um, that it's a danger when you start getting rid of different kinds of animals and birds, that in the same way we need a diversity of kinds of love, and that that diversity of love ultimately serves to strengthen the ecosphere of kindness. Depression was not an identity that I sought. Um, but I found that one's identity can arise from the strange fact of one's biology, and that acknowledging it as an identity was a powerful thing to do. And I started writing about it, writing first a magazine article that then led um, to the book that's been published here. I've had, I think, 14 interviews since I arrived in Romania two days ago um, about that book. And every single person I've talked to has said, wasn't it very difficult for you to be so public about your experience? And the answer, which I didn't give to everyone in the wake of the National Library being canceled and so on, because I didn't know that people would relate to it, but my feeling was that I had been in a closet for a long time at an earlier part of my life, and I had hated being in a closet, and when I finally came out of that closet, I felt like I could be myself. And I thought, I'll be damned if I'm going to be back in another closet and have some other fundamental factor of myself that I'm trying to hide from people and from which I'm trying to distract people. I believe that family is often what mediates between the individual and the society and that acceptance really is contingent a lot of the time on a coordinated um, uh, sort of full frontal attack in which you learn to accept yourself, you encourage your family to accept you, and then you try to persuade the larger society to join in, um, in that ritual of acceptance. That accepting a child who is gay, and accepting a child who is deaf, and accepting a child who is transgender, or who is a dwarf, or who has autism, or who is in any of a variety of other categories I looked at, that it has a great deal in common. That that process of acceptance, that intense process of recognizing someone for who they are, is a powerful one. Now, underlying it is what I think is one of the very central questions of parenthood. Parents have to do two things. Parents have to change their children. You give your child an education, you teach your child some values, you perhaps teach your child some manners if you're lucky. Um, these are all things that a parent has to change. Not changing your children constitutes neglect. But parents need also to celebrate their children for who they are and to give them a positive self-image. One of the mothers I interviewed when I was writing my most recent book, which was about all of these families of children with horizontal identities, is the mother of two children with very severe multiple disabilities. And um, she talked about uh, the ways in which um, she had learned from bringing up these children and she, how much joy she had found in motherhood, even if these children who seemed not what a mother would want. And she said, people always regale us with these little sayings, like, God doesn't give you any more than you can handle. But children like ours are not preordained as a gift. They're a gift because that's what we have chosen. And that idea of choice was very strong for me. What are those choices and how do we make them? And it was my conclusion that we make those choices all through our lives. There was one woman I interviewed 
who uh, had been brutally raped when she was 16 years old, became pregnant through that rape. Her entire life was derailed. She had hoped to be a doctor. Instead of going to medical school, she stayed home with this baby that she hadn't wanted. Um, it was a very, very difficult uh, course of things. And I said to her, uh, when I interviewed her, at which point she was 50, I said, do you think often about the man who raped you? And she said, I used to think about him with anger, but now only with pity. And I said, pity? I assume she meant pity because he was so unevolved as to do this terrible thing. And she said, yes, she said, pity, because he has a beautiful daughter and two beautiful grandchildren, and he doesn't know that, and I do. So as it turns out, I'm the lucky one. And I thought how extraordinary it was to have been able to take an experience that was as agonizing as the one she'd been through and to come to the point many, many, many years later, but to come to the point of actually describing it as a lucky circumstance. Here it is again, a family that perceives itself to be normal with a child whom they perceive to be exceptional in some very profound way. And I hatched the idea that there are essentially two kinds of identities. There are what I've called vertical identities because they're passed down generationally from parent to child. So your ethnicity is in general a vertical identity. Your nationality, usually your language, frequently your religion. These are things you're likely to have in common with your parents. There are arguments that can be made that any of these identities can be difficult to live with, but there's no one doing research on how to make them go away. And then there are what I call horizontal identities. Horizontal identities because they're learned not from your parents and the generation before, but from your peer group. So being gay, being deaf, being a dwarf, being in many other categories that I looked at in my most recent book, all of those are horizontal identities that you learn from the peers around you. And I thought these horizontal identities have a great deal in common. There's a great deal that's true of all of these horizontal identities that is not true um, of all other ways of being. Love is something that should ideally be there from the moment a child is born. That child's parents should love that child. And while we all know terrible stories of abuse and neglect, my experience is that most parents love their children, or at least try to love their children. But acceptance is something else. Acceptance for all parents is the recognition of your child as a separate person with separate priorities, with a separate way of being. And some parents are good at acceptance, and some parents are not very good at acceptance. Now, acceptance is something that has to exist at three levels. There's self-acceptance, there's family acceptance, and there's acceptance by the larger society. I'm often asked who the people are who do the best. And there's an unfortunate truth, which I try not to say too often because it's not very helpful, which is that the people who are capable of loving and of being loved are likely to do better than the people who are so socially isolated as to have no human connections. I try not to say it too often because if you are one of those people who is too socially isolated, being told you do better if you could only love people and be loved by them is not helpful. People can't make that leap so readily. It's not that love actually makes the depression go away. It does not do that. But love provides a beacon so that when you are depressed, you know, if I could only get better, there is this thing, there is this love on the other side, and I might be able to arrive at it. And love is also something that makes you feel the value of my life seems nil to me, but it seems that my life has value to other people and I have to go on living it because I have some debt to those people who love me. And that's an extraordinarily important thing to feel. Now, in extreme depression, people become in many ways delusional. They also become in some ways insightful, and that's a, a complicated whole other conversation. But they can become delusional and think everyone be, would be better off without me. But many of the people I talk to describe how when they really felt like giving up, they knew that there were these other people who were pressing them to keep going, and that makes an enormous difference. Now, the people pressing you to keep going can also be incredibly annoying. 
and then they often will try to tell you how you really should feel better and how your life really is okay and how everything is actually wonderful. And there's a wonderful um, set of uh, cartoons which are up on the internet which were done by uh, a woman in America who had suffered from extreme depression and she compared this part of the experience to um, having a conversation with her friends and saying, my pet fish is dead. And her friends all saying, but maybe it won't be dead on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, you know, it was very, very intense. And people would say, you know, it might not be dead if you only gave it more water. Um, because it, it's dead. The fish is dead. Um, so the feeling of depression is very much the fish is dead. Um, but I think that the, uh, the experience of having people around you um, uh, of having those experiences of love is transformative. And I think for a lot of the people I talked about, they came out with this sense that they were more capable of love than they were when they went in. I mean, I love what one of them, a woman named Laura Anderson said. She described how she had been having a debate with some people about uh, the death penalty for crime in America and whether it was right or wrong. And she said, having been through what I've been through, I understand how distorted one's thinking can be and how it can lead one into strange and terrible places. And while I would never want depression to be a public or political excuse, I realize that having had it allows me to be more generous to those around me, allows me even to tolerate the evil in the world. I thought that was such a profound statement of it. And one of the other people in the book said, I suppose in depression, I learned to give all the things I need, and that has made me a better friend and a better companion to the people I care about. So is the only way to become that loving to go through a clinical depression? No, certainly not. But is there a great question of love running through depression, the love that exists while you're depressed, your own love for other people, the way your capacity for love will change? I found the word love came up over and over and over again as I interviewed these people who were depressed. I said earlier that depression is a disease of loneliness and the emergence from depression is in some profound way an experience of love, I think, for almost all of the people who, um, who emerge. I'll end by describing something which is actually even far from the tree, but it was a woman I interviewed who had um, a schizophrenia, um, and she had what was called a, schi what's called a schizoaffective disorder, so she had both schizophrenia and depression. And she had spent many years being acutely, floridly psychotic, um, and um, living on the streets and um, mutilating herself. And I mean, a really terrible history. And she was finally brought into appropriate treatment at um, a mental hospital um, in, um, in America. Uh, and she said to me, I remember the first time I felt love after all that. I don't even remember who it was, probably my therapist. I don't remember it being ecstatic. I just remember a little tug, like when I was a little girl and I would go fishing and catch a sunfish, just that little pull at the other end of the line. And as the psychosis receded, it left room for my heart to grow. It's easy to exorcise the demons of schizophrenics because they believe that there's something foreign running around inside them. But it's harder with depressives because we believe that we are seeing the truth. But the truth lies. And what she meant in saying that was that often depression is accompanied with very real insights. Um, uh, there's um, a, a sense that when you are depressed, you see some things more clearly and more accurately than otherwise. You are stripped of a kind of protective coating of optimism with which most of us live in the world. Um, but that even though what you've seen is true, it is not actually helpful to recognize it as truth and your relationship to it as truth can be very distorted. So um, I would give the example that somebody who has depression may say, it just is so clear to me that no matter what we do, we're all just going to die in the end. Or may say, you know, I have these, um, uh, uh, this wish for unity with another human being, and in the end, none of us really knows anyone else, and no one else ever really knows us. And someone who is not depressed will say, all of that is true, but it's a lovely day today, and the flowers are in bloom, and let's go for a walk in the park. And it's not that the person who feels well denies that reality, 
It's that the consequences or the implications of that reality are different. And you see people who have these children who um, have these various problems, or you see people who are dealing with depression, or you see any of the other, you see Soviet artists, um, you know, they did not enjoy the periods when um, they were sent to labor camps, some of the people I was writing about, or even when they were called in for questioning by the KGB, but they were determined that they were going to take their experience and they were going to make something of worth out of it. And I will wrap that up by saying, some people said to me, was writing your book about depression very cathartic? Did you experience a great release from writing the book? Writing the book was very painful. It involved returning to very difficult experiences I have had and reliving them and finding words for them. And it involved writing about the difficult experiences of other people that triggered some of those darknesses within me. So it was difficult in those ways. But I felt that in writing the book, I took a stretch of my life which felt when I was reading it like it was useless and barren and completely free of content and made of it something that might have a little bit of worth to other people. And that was a transformative process for me. I hope the book isn't idiotically optimistic. I don't think it is, uh, but I think that was the direction. And when we talk about a truth that lies, I would say that when I was depressed, I felt that my life had no purpose and no meaning, but I, and I knew that that might be distorted thinking. But it was completely clear to me that my depression had no purpose and no meaning. It was horror. It was nothing but horror. It was useless to everyone. I was useless to everyone. And in writing the book, I managed to shift that perception. So the truth I saw then lied in a way, or at least seems to have lied from the vantage point of where I am now. So over the years, I became, in a way, a student of adversity. And as I looked at adversity, I was always struck by the fact that there seem to be some people who are defeated by relatively minor challenges, and other people who, when faced with major challenges, seem to draw some kind of strength from them. There's a sort of popular wisdom that says that that has to do with finding meaning. And for a long time, I thought that meaning was out there, waiting to be found, that it was inherent in people's life experience, and you needed only to be awake to it. But over time, I came to think otherwise. I came to think that whether the meaning existed was not actually a meaningful question, and that in fact what people were doing was forging meaning. They were creating that meaning um, when it was not there before, and that their doing it was an act of determination. In fact, I found that finding meaning matters much less than seeking meaning. I talked about the idea that you don't find but rather forge meaning. And after you forge meaning, your next obligation is to build a new identity which comes out of that meaning, to recognize your traumas as part of who you've come to be, and fold the worst events of your life into a narrative of triumph by evincing a better self in response to things that hurt. So in my uh, book, as I worked on it, I found that the people who believe that having a disabled child had taught them something, had made them think more deeply, had given them a, a purposefulness in their lives that they wouldn't otherwise have had. Those people actually seem to me to be living rather good lives. And the people who saw no purpose in it and who felt that it had no real content were the ones who seemed to me to have lives that were destroyed by their experience. And I thought this forging meaning thing isn't just something you do for fun. This forging meaning thing is a means of survival. And I then came across a study, an interesting study that was done, in which parents were interviewed when they first had children with a variety of disabilities, and they were rated as optimists or pessimists. And then the families were visited two years later. And the families in which the mothers had been rated as optimists, the children had made more progress in their skills than in the families in which the mothers had been rated as pessimists. So I feel, again, um, like this question of identity depends um, a great deal on a kind of disciplined optimism, the kind of disciplined optimism that in many ways lies behind the formation of a group such as ASCEPT, um, that belief and that hope that change is possible and can be achieved. Assuming these woes, these difficulties, these things you've struggled with as identities 
is a way of locating a common experience. It allows you to draw strength from others who share this experience, and it allows you to give strength to others who share this experience. Um, you discover, especially in this internet era, um, a world of community, a powerful world of community, and you substitute um, the word and for the word but. So you say, not I'm here, but I'm gay, but rather I am gay and I am here. So, forging meaning and building identity. Forging meaning and building identity. That became a sort of mantra for me, a thing I repeated over and over again to myself. Forging meaning is about changing yourself, and building identity is about changing the world that you live in. Those of us with stigmatized identities face this question on a daily basis. How much to change ourselves, to conform um, to the demands of the world around us, and how much to struggle to change the world around us to be more accepting of our differences. Finding meaning and building identity does not make what was wrong right, but it can make what was wrong precious. So I went in January to Myanmar. Um, I was there writing uh, an article, and I was mostly interviewing ex-political prisoners. And when I interviewed them, I was very struck by the fact that they were much less embittered than I would have expected about the years they'd spent as prisoners. Um, uh, many of them actually uh, talked about it as a time when they had been able to engage in deep self-reflection and in which they'd uh, grown tremendously. But they were also much less enthusiastic than I had anticipated they would be about the changes that were taking place in their political system. And I said to one of the leading human rights activists, Dr. Ma Fida, who um, had spent many years in political prisoner, five of them in solitary confinement, who almost died in prison, and who's since written a best-selling book about those experiences, I said that I was surprised by both things. And she said, we Burmese are very good at demonstrating grace under pressure, but we also experience grievance under glamour. And the fact that some concessions have made does not blind us to everything that's wrong with this society which we learn to understand so well from our prison cells. And I thought that was a very powerful statement and it resonated with some of my own experiences during the late days of the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe, um, that there was a kind of expectation from abroad that because things were changing, everyone was going to be dancing in the streets. And there was an understanding up close that there were still so many problems to consider and to resolve. So I thought when I listened to Mafira, you can forge meaning and build identity and still be mad as hell. The idea of forging meaning and building identity was one that came to me when I was older through my exposure to people who had had far worse privation than anything that I had ever known. Um, and yet, when I was growing up, I hated identity politics. I thought it seemed to me like a way of pretending to celebrate things you actually regretted. And I saw nothing to celebrate in the ways in which I deviated from the mainstream. So I went to extraordinary lengths to try to be straight because I thought that was the better way to be. At the time, there was something in rather obscure practice in the United States called sexual surrogacy therapy. And I read about it in a magazine, and I called an office um, in New York on West 47th Street, and I made appointments to go for this sexual surrogacy therapy, which was meant for people who had sexual difficulties, without admitting to them, or even fully admitting to myself, that the difficulty I had was not in sexual performance, but in who it was I wanted to have sexual performance with. And so I went once a week to this strange office, and I met with people I was encouraged to call doctors, who assigned what I was encouraged to call exercises, with women whom I was encouraged to call therapists, who were not exactly prostitutes, 
but who were also not exactly anything else. <laughs> My particular favorite was a blonde woman from the American Deep South who eventually admitted to me that she was a necrophiliac, which is to say someone who has um, a sex with corpses, and that she had taken this job after she got in trouble down at the morgue. <laughs> um, I was pleased to think that my own sweaty, anxious um, body was close enough to a corpse to keep her going. Um, and actually that experience was in some ways quite valuable. It helped me to overcome a lot of discomfort I had, and it paved the way for me to have later sexual relationships with women, some of whom I loved very much. Some of those relationships were themselves very happy, but I was at war with myself, and what I was doing was to dig wounds into my own psyche, and that process of not accepting and not accepting and not accepting who I was, who I loved, what I wanted, what I felt, it was such a poisonous, such a toxic way of doing things. So while in some ways, I find the memory of that place on 47th Street entertaining. At another level, I can almost not bear to think about it because it was the apotheosis of a kind of self-hatred um, that I had learned and found. Identity politics should be um, not a smug label um, or a gold medal, um, but a revolution and a way to live, um, a way to live better. So the condition in the world in 29 states in the United States, I could legally be fired or denied housing for being gay. We all know, I think, the Russian anti-propaganda law, which has led to gay people being beaten up in the streets. 27 African countries have passed anti-sodomy statutes. In Nigeria, you can be legally stoned to death, and lynchings have become commonplace. Zimbabwe, the president said that gay people are filth and has threatened to behead them all. And in Saudi Arabia recently, two men who were caught having sexual relations with each other were each sentenced to 7,000 lashes and are both permanently disabled. India's court, as we know, recently ruled that gay sex was illegal. Um, so who can forge meaning and build identity in the face of all of that? I'm in Romania at the moment because I've written a book about depression. And my depression really set in when I was in my um, late 20s. Um, I'd been through a number of difficult things. I had a relationship that I had been in for a long time that ended. My mother had died. I had moved from England where I lived for a while to New York. Uh, and I didn't have my life figured out in New York yet. There were all kinds of things that were wrong. Um, but. Uh, but nonetheless, um, they began to escalate into this serious depression. I've been talking a lot since I got to Romania about the experience of depression. I'll give you just a brief synopsis. But for me, it was the feeling all the time um, of a complete lack of vitality, a lack of the energy needed to lead my own life. I would think to myself, oh, I should get up and take a shower. And I would think, right, but I'd have to get out of bed and walk across the room and turn on the light in the bathroom, and turn on the water, and stand underneath it, and find the soap, and get out, and find a towel. And it just all sounded to me so difficult. It sounded like the Stations of the Cross. And one of the things that often gets lost in conversations about depression is that you know it's ridiculous even while you're in it. And you know that most people get up and take a shower and go out to face the day without any particular difficulty attached to it. And yet, when you're in it, it becomes overwhelming. And they're then set in this intense anxiety, this feeling all the time, which was like the feeling you have if you slip or trip in that minute before, that second before you hit the ground, but drawn out week after week after week. And I felt so frightened, and I didn't know what I was frightened of, but I felt like I was going to explode with the anxiety. And I finally woke up one day feeling so scared and so overwhelmed that I couldn't move, and I thought, I really need help. And I looked at the telephone next to my bed, and I couldn't muster the will to reach out and pick it up. And finally, after three hours, the phone rang, and I managed to answer it. And it was my father, and I said to him, I need some help. I was not in a relationship at the time. I didn't know whether I ever would be. I didn't think I would have children. 
I didn't feel like I was ever going to work out any of the things that mattered to me. And I was ashamed at that age to be moving back into my father's house. It felt so terribly juvenile. And then I went through all of the rituals of treatment. I began psychotherapy. I took antidepressant medication. I emerged. I decided I was fine. I went off everything. I relapsed. I emerged. And I relapsed. And I emerged. And I relapsed. There were a few primary challenges in writing this book. Um, the first, I would say, was that I wanted to use my own experience without being self-aggrandizing or self-indulgent or subjecting everyone kind of tediously to the petty details of my day-to-day -day life. And so that was a balance that I had to strike. Um, the second was that I wanted to interview people about their experience of depression in a way that would accumulate and represent much of what the condition entails. So I didn't want to sort of class them, you know, this is the suicidal depressive, this is the alcoholic depressive, this is the young depressive, this is the old depressive, but at the same time I wanted to describe all of those experiences. And so the process of choosing the people whom I would interview, the book contains long profiles of people I interviewed, was a complicated one. And some of the people were friends before I began, and some of the people became friends in the course of writing it. Some of the people are not friends at all, um, but that was um, that was part of the uh, that was part of the enterprise. Um, and uh, then I started accumulating this information, and there were there were days when I would come back, and I would recognize anew that depression can be highly contagious, especially for someone who has experienced depression. And sometimes I would come back from doing a long set of interviews with somebody. And I would come back to my room and I would fall on the bed in the hotel in the strange place where I might be staying. And I would just lie there from four in the afternoon when I got back until the next morning because I felt so weighted down with the suffering and difficulty of other people. I remember particularly um, interviewing the man who's referred to in the book as Frank Rusakoff, um, who is an extraordinary person. I have become um, a, a close friend uh, over the years since the book was written. Uh, but he had the most terrible, debilitating, acute depression. Uh, he was having constant electroshock treatments. He was pale and barely able to talk. And I could feel through the terrible difficulty of his situation that he was determined to tell me his story. One of his doctors had asked that he do so. I had said that his story contained certain elements that I thought would be powerful for my book from what I knew of it. And I felt that courage, the great courage it took him to tell his story. And I felt that I had to rise up and try, uh, in some sense, to meet that courage. So it was painful in that regard as well. It felt like there was the contagion of other people's depression and the weight of responsibility that fell on my shoulders. If he could make that much effort to tell his story, I had better find a way to tell it that was equal to his telling of it to me. In addition to that, it was a very difficult book to organize because it contained so many different kinds of investigation and so many different kinds of stories. And there was a period when it felt endlessly like a jigsaw puzzle from which half the pieces were missing and half the pieces from another puzzle had been added. I couldn't figure out how to make everything fit together. And there were times when I grew terribly frustrated by that and thought, oh, I wish it were more coherent. I wish I could make it hold together. And I went through periods, the word despair is a little bit perhaps melodramatic, but periods when I felt I had worked on this book for years, but for years I had devoted myself to it and I couldn't do it. It wasn't going to come together. It wasn't going to make any kind of sense. Um, and that was part of it in the later stages because I had written it in all these bits and pieces as I went along and I was trying uh, to fit them together. So there were many areas of concern and anxiety, but I feel it would be unfair and inappropriate to leave out the fact that there were also moments of um, revelation and joy in the process. The joy of suddenly thinking, oh, I see, this fits together with that. The joy of hearing stories from people who had fought so admirably against their depression some of whom had managed to find um, remission, and others of whom had found a way to have a meaningful life despite having severe depression. Um, and moments of joy uh, when I thought, 
that there were so many other people to whom these stories that I was hearing might be helpful. Um, moments of real joy in thinking, depression is above all a disease of loneliness. And hearing the stories of these other people, which made me myself feel so much less lonely, I thought if I can convey them properly, they will make other people less lonely in this experience as well. And that was a very thrilling sensation. I would begin by saying that speaking for myself, I am enormously attached to the suffering that is in my past, and I dread the suffering that is in my future. I think there is no question that there is nobility to be found in anguish. Um, and I also think that there is a lot of anguish to be found in anguish. It wasn't until I completed Far From the Tree that I understood the unifying theme of my life's work. My first book, as you've heard, was about a group of Soviet artists and how their lives changed during Glasnost. It was really about how people took circumstances of great adversity and made them into the occasion for enormous dignity. My second book was a novel loosely based on my mother's illness and death um, when she had uh, died of cancer at 58. She took the occasion of being so sick and of dying and made it the basis for a great intimacy within our family that stays with me uh, even now, 23 years later. Um, 23 years later in, in two days. Um, I uh, then wrote the book about depression, which is in part about how people ultimately have found some meaning in their experience of depression, and then Far From the Tree, in which I looked at how families respond to children with various differences and disabilities, and so on and so forth. And once more, it's about how you can ultimately bring about a feeling of strength um, from the experience of adversity. Um, so yes, that's absolutely a, a running theme. I tend to feel that we have uh, organically a mood spectrum, which is very, very useful. Um, it, it would be terrible to cut out any part of the mood spectrum. It is important to be able to feel happy and sad and angry, and frustrated, and envious, and all of the other many ways that people feel. Um, and if you pulled any one of them out, you would diminish humanity. Clinical depression, I think, is a dysregulation of that crucial mood spectrum. And so uh, it really manifests as, um, as an illness. Um, and if it were possible to cure it and make it go away, I would cure it and make it go away. But I would cure it and make it go away with the understanding that we would never be able to get rid of the kind of woe that becomes formative for people and from which meaning is derived. So um, I feel as though I grew enormously through my experience of depression. But I suspect I could have grown enormously through the experience of having a child with severe disabilities or through the experience of having cancer or through a whole variety of other difficult experiences. When I wrote The New Day Demon, I hadn't yet quite thought it through, and I wasn't sure that there were other paths to this same enlightenment, but I came to think um, uh, that there were. Um, that having been said, I think uh, depression is illuminating in very particular ways, and Mircea generously spoke of uh, the advent of compassion in the book. I think I was a reasonably compassionate person in the first place, but I don't think I was compassionate in anything like the same way. Voltaire once said um, that we can only sympathize with the problems we ourselves have had. And I think there's a great deal of truth in that. And I think I therefore have a particular sympathy for people who are dealing with depression or indeed other related forms of mental illness. But I think the insights from depression in fact, even if they don't tell me what everyone else's experience is like under every other circumstance, have made me understand what it is that I don't understand. They've made me understand how particular any experience of suffering may be, how anguishing any particular experience uh, of anguish may be, and therefore, even if someone has an anguish that doesn't make sense to me, or for which I don't have a fluent vocabulary, I'm able to appreciate um, the urgency, I think, of their pain in a way that I wasn't before this happened to me. I had had, in many ways, a fairly protected American childhood. 
which had since, you know, real ups and downs, things that didn't go well and things that I wasn't happy about and frustrations, but essentially it had been in a very um, contained world. And I wondered when I first came to be close to the artists I was writing about in Moscow and as it then was Leningrad, I thought, I wonder why it is that we all strike such a, a sympathetic relationship so quickly. Um, there was something in their resilience in the face of sadness that felt to me very familiar. Over time, I came to think that my mother had had some degree of depression and that she had stood up very staunchly to it. She died before my first real depression occurred and so I never got to talk to her about it. But I thought that model of resilience was actually present in the household in which I grew up. And I had the experience, as some of you know, of being a gay kid who was teased at school and I went through those difficulties. And I think they were preparation for the experience of depression. But the depression showed me how profound and terrible one's pain could be, at least how profound and terrible mine could be. I don't want to do a kind of comparison. There are certainly other people who've had much more difficult lives than I've had. Um, and it made me aware um, that other people must be suffering in this way too. And um, insofar as I'm a kind person, which I try to be, I think that oppression made me a great deal kinder. Um, and one of the hopes that I've had for the book is that it will help not only the people directly affected by depression, but the people who are themselves more resilient to have an access um, to that greater and more profound shared humanity. I have always been interested in the travails of the, of the poor. My father grew up in poverty. I did not, but he did, and so I grew up with some stories um, out of poverty. Uh, but uh, quite apart from that, I was struck by this persistent um, uh, statement that depression was somehow a, a luxury and a middle class thing and for people who had all the time for it. And I thought, okay, it seems fairly clear. Depression is caused by a genetic vulnerability or a biological vulnerability that gets triggered by some kind of external circumstances. And if one assumes that the vulnerability is consistent across populations, and there's certainly no basis for assuming otherwise, the triggering circumstances must be much more frequent among people who are living at the bottom of the social ladder than they are among people who are living higher up. And I thought, why would it be that we perceive depression in this way? And the insight I came to is that if you have a life which is essentially and profoundly a wonderful life, and you nonetheless feel miserable all the time, you think, what is wrong with me that I feel this way? And quite possibly, you talk to people around you, and you eventually talk to a doctor, and you say, it's just bizarre. I know I have this lovely life, and nonetheless, I feel like killing myself, or I find it impossible to get out of bed, or whatever the other manifestations of your depression may be. If you have a life which is absolutely terrible, in which you don't have enough to eat, in which you're trying to work four jobs to keep things going, in which you have children who are not doing well in school, in which you have all of these other um, strains and stresses which are characteristic of the lives of very poor people, and you feel terrible all the time, it doesn't occur to you that you have an illness because the way you feel makes complete sense in connection with the way your life is. And I thought, ultimately, it must be the case, and indeed my research showed that it was, that in many instances, it's not that these people feel miserable and awful because they have such bad lives, but rather that they have such bad lives because they are feeling too depressed to be able to fix any of what's wrong with their lives. And that in many instances, if we were able to bring them some degree of relief from the depression they were grappling with, they would then have the life force, the vital energy that is the opposite of depression that they could harness to the improvement of their own situation and condition. So I looked around to see if anyone was doing work among um, indigent depressed people. Um, and I made um, various inquiries and I eventually found a number of academics who were doing studies of various kinds in which they tried to look at treatment of depression among the very poor. And the one whose work most gripped me was a woman named Jeannie Miranda who was teaching at a university in, um, in New York. And she was a, uh, I mean, sorry, in Washington, D.C. And she had started a project in which she went off into um, a family planning clinic where people would come to get birth control. 
and she would interview the women as they came through there. They were impoverished women coming through there. And when she assessed any of them as having depression, she would ask them to enroll in her study. And a lot of them said no, and a lot of them thought that they didn't know what she was talking about, and a lot of them felt like it was one more thing to deal with and they couldn't deal with anything more. But she was a mix of quite charming and quite insistent, and she managed to enroll quite a lot of these women. And she gave them access to one medication, which was the one she had managed to get a supply of for her study, and group therapy that they did all together. And I went and I met the women she had worked with, and the stories they told and the quality of the transformation of their lives was so astonishing and so humbling um, as to leave me nearly speechless. There was one woman I remember meeting who talked about how she had only wanted to die. She said she had nothing to say to her own children. She had seven of her own children. She said she couldn't even talk to them. The man she was with was the father of most of the children um, and told her that she was terrible and she was useless and um, uh, her and was very abusive. I mean, it was a terrible, terrible set of circumstances. And she said, I would spend the day hiding in bed. I couldn't get up. And when the children came home, I would hide deeper under the cover so I didn't have to see them. And then, a year later, she had a job working in childcare for the US Navy. She had separated from this abusive man she'd been with for so many years. Her children were all suddenly doing well in school because she sat with them doing their homework. She described this extraordinary change in her life. And she finished it by saying, I prayed to the Lord to send me an angel, and he heard my prayers. And that was her reaction to this woman who had pulled her rather unwillingly into, um, into her study. And I thought, how can it be that this degree of improvement is possible and we're not doing it and we're not trying to fix these lives? I was horrified. And not all of the women whom Jeannie Miranda had enrolled had done as well as this woman and not all of them could speak about the change as well as she could. But most of them were doing at least somewhat better and some of them were doing a lot better. And so I went down to Washington, D.C to meet with people on Capitol Hill. And I said, treating this population and bringing about a resolution of their depression is obviously the humane thing to do. These are people who are suffering and we can alleviate their suffering. I said, but even if we're not motivated by that concern, these people are unemployed, are not working, are not part of the functional economy, are not able to take care of their children, and with relatively simple and straightforward intervention, they can become more functional, and these parents are no longer on social welfare, and these children are no longer headed into lives of crime and in the prison system. I said it is actually to both our humanitarian and our economic advantage to do this. And I met with two congressmen. Um, one of them was a Republican from the city more conservative side of the American political spectrum, and one was a Democrat from the more liberal side. And the conservative Republican said, well, it would be great to set up bigger programs like the one you're describing, but it's not so easy to do, and um, it's very expensive, and we have the budget that's structured this way, and we couldn't really get the funds now to do it. He had all of these technical reasons why it would be difficult to do. And then I went to talk to the liberal congressman, who was a, a really great, who was a senator named Paul Wellstone, and one of our very great senators who tragically died in a plane crash just a couple of years after this conversation. And Paul Wellstone said to me, it is true that the programs you're describing would be in both our humanitarian and our economic interest. He said, but to set them up would require the expenditure of enormous political capital, and nobody in government can afford to do this if it doesn't appeal to voters, and they aren't going to take any interest in it. He said, and to set up the kind of programs that you're talking about would involve um, uh, affecting people who nobody looks at and nobody cares about. He said, in an electoral democracy, all of the voters have representation here on Capitol Hill, but the people you're describing aren't voting on election day. They're at home with the covers pulled up over their heads, and the people who are voting don't know about them or don't care about them. So until you manage to raise some bigger awareness, nobody will be able to institute those programs, even if they serve every possible interest of the country. And I remember leaving with a really heavy heart after that conversation. 
And one of the reasons I wrote about this passionately and try to speak about it passionately is that I hope people all over the world will become aware of this problem and of the intensity of this problem and will become concerned enough about it so that it does become a matter of interest to elected officials so that they can spend the political capital to make better lives for these people and indeed for all of us. I remember when I was in college and uh, we were reading um, some historic text and one of the students uh, stood up and said, uh, as a modern woman, what do I have to learn from Lawrence Stern? And I thought, okay, but we all have a great deal to learn from everything of the past and not only from the things that were written by people like us and about people like us. The way that we become richer and more satisfying selves is by engaging with whatever wisdom has accumulated across the centuries and never suspect that the ways in which the people around us have interpreted the past will conform to the ways that we ourselves make sense out of the past. So I was inspired by many historical models. I didn't know um, uh, uh, the anatomy of melancholy. I knew of it, but I had never really looked at it until I began planning to do my own writing about depression, which was shortly after I had experienced a very severe depression. And as I plunged myself into that work, I was astonished and humbled by its scope um, and by the many ways in which it addressed um, uh, the problem of melancholy. Um, I cannot say that I've read it through cover to cover from the beginning to the end. I've read bits and pieces of it over time. I keep it by my bed. I read other bits and pieces as I go along. Um, some of it is difficult and turgid. Some of it is lucid and very readable. Um, uh, it's an extraordinary book, though. I think the thing that I have felt as a problem in contemporary nonfiction altogether, and certainly in writing in this particular field, is that we live in a time of specialization, when depth of knowledge is considered the only true achievement. And in point of fact, there is a great deal to be achieved from depth of knowledge, but also a great deal to be achieved from breadth of knowledge. And so we often now have people, if you go to a doctor, he's a specialist in this particular bone in your ankle, um, and he knows exactly how to fix that bone, and that's tremendous. But it's frequently problematical if he doesn't understand what goes on in the rest of the body. And I felt as I looked in the field of um, depression in particular, psychology in general, but to some degree in the world of nonfiction altogether, that people tended to write within a narrow scope of knowledge. So in depression, there were personal memoirs in which people told their own stories in very beautiful and very striking language um, sometimes, sometimes not. Um, and they were terrific, but they were really books about one person and one person's experience. And there were medical texts which tried to look at the biochemistry or the brain physiology associated with depression. And there were sociological studies which looked at the nature of mental illness across societies. But there was nothing that brought them together. Mircha said that I can describe my book as a, a synthesis, and in many ways it is a synthesis. But I think a synthesis is not a matter simply of taking the information from five different branches of learning and putting it all in one book. A synthesis entails taking the insights from five different branches of learning and figuring out how they connect to one another. So I had the revelation, which was to me a kind of blinding revelation, that some people talked about depression in biochemical terms, and some people talked about depression in philosophical terms. A dichotomy that goes back to arguments between Hippocrates, who claimed that depression was an organic dysfunction of the brain to be treated with oral remedies, and Plato, who claimed that it was a philosophical problem to be resolved through discourse. And I thought, there's been an opposition, this constant argument about what is depression. And I thought, these are not two different um, things that are being described. They're two different vocabularies for a single problem. And if we can muster the coherence of that single vocabulary, if we can say, okay, you can talk about it this way, you can talk about it that way, you can talk about it in French, you can talk about it in German, you can talk about it in Romanian and English, you are still talking about the same thing. And if you can only understand how the insights from one area are connected to the insights of another area, then you'll actually have something. 
Now, when Burton was writing, he of course didn't have the level of medical knowledge that we have today. Um, he didn't have the same philosophical positions that we have in a postmodern era, though he certainly had a very profound knowledge of the history of philosophy. Um, but what he was doing really was trying to say, this is, this is a knot, this is a kind of Gordian knot, this is something that can't be dis un untangled, and so the only way to talk about it is to come at it from every direction, this way, and this way, and this way, and this way. And that seemed to me like a model that had been lost. So when I say that I believe in breadth of knowledge, it was in that instance breadth of knowledge on the subject of depression. It was not that I was trying to um, also talk about um, infectious disease or that I was trying to talk about um, medieval French painting. But in talking that there are in fact medieval French paintings that seem to contain elements of depression. Um, and there are in fact infectious diseases that have depression among their side effects. It became clear to me as I worked that in order to talk about depression, you had to really talk about the world, you had to talk about human nature, you had to talk about the heart and consciousness. In an era of medication, you had to talk about what constitutes the self and what it means to have a self which can be changed or altered or improved through these kinds of chemical interventions. You had to look at the fascinating evidence that the change is brought about by medication and the changes brought about by extended psychotherapy are in many instances, so far as we can tell with the imaging technologies to which we have access, the same changes. What did that mean? What did it mean that you could change your brain in either of these ways and come to the same place? I felt that you had to really understand what it was to be human. So it was at once quite a focused project and quite a fast project. And of course, there are also theological elements to it. What does it mean to be, um, a, a, to be a created person? What does it mean um, to look at philosophical uh, ideas that have come out of religion that have at some time posed um, a, a depression uh, or acedia as a sin, but have at some time, in fact, glorified um, the woe and pain and suffering as the way through which we come to greater knowledge? How can we look at it in all of these ways? And so that's what I set out to do. My qualification was that I myself had suffered from very severe depression, for which I had received treatment, for which I continue to receive treatment. And I felt I had to include my autobiography in order to show that I had a qualification to make this inquiry. But the more I thought about it, the broader it got. And I looked at depression across cultures, I looked at depression across classes, I looked at depression across history, um, and I tried to figure out how you can take the insights in Hamlet, um, Shakespeare's Hamlet, and put, which is of course in many ways the greatest portrait there ever was of depression, how you can put together Hamlet and modern neuroscience and come out with something coherent that can include them both. I should begin by saying that I feel incredibly lucky to live now and not 50 or 100 years ago because I feel like the treatments for depression which I have medications and a fairly advanced um, uh, version of psychoanalytic therapy um, have allowed me to have a rich, rewarding, fascinating life in which I'm able um, uh, to live deeply in the world, to come to Romania, to be up here on the stage in front of you. And I suspect if I had lived in another era, I would not have had these treatments, I would not have been able to have such a good life. Now having said that, I hope that when my children are my age, they will say, did you really do that? Did you really take those medications? Did you really go through that? It sounds so awful. I hope that what now passes for modern science will seem primitive soon, because the medications have side effects. The psychotherapy is only partially effective. There are so many other bits and pieces to complain about in, um, in the treatments that we have, advanced though they may be in comparative terms. I started off my book as a real medical conservative. I thought there were essentially three things that were effective for the treatment of depression. And those were certain forms of talk therapy, especially cognitive behavioral therapy, um, uh, antidepressant medications, and uh, electroshock treatment for people with more severe depression. And I thought nothing else needed to be taken seriously. I came away from the book feeling as though uh, actually, there are all kinds of things that seem to work for all kinds of people. If you have brain cancer, 
and you say that it makes you feel better to stand on your head for half an hour every morning, it may make you feel better, but you still have brain cancer and you'll still most likely die from it. But if you have depression and you say it makes you feel better to stand on your head for half an hour every morning, then it's worked. Because if you feel better, then you are no longer depressed. Depression is an illness of how you feel. And I met people who had been helped by an extraordinary array of um, and treatments and interventions and behaviors. Um, there was one woman who wrote to me and said that she had tried medication, she had tried therapy, she had tried everything and she wanted to tell me about the thing that truly worked for her so that I could tell the world. And that was making little things from yarn. Now having said that, I think there's sometimes a danger when people say, I'm actually going to try to treat my depression with herbal tea because actually depression can escalate and it can escalate quite rapidly and the proven treatments are the ones that I knew about at the beginning and those proven treatments are most effective if they're deployed early um, and people who are busy saying I don't want to do this, I don't want to take the medication, I don't want to do it, just wait a little while, let me see how things go, sometimes escalate into suicidality and they end up dead. But even if they don't escalate into suicide, and even if they don't um, end up dying from this condition, the fact that they are um, uh, waiting it out um, uses up a lot of time. And I often find myself talking to people and saying, maybe without medication, you will cycle back out of your depression. It's a cyclical condition. People mostly do cycle back out of it. But you're 35 right now, and if it takes a year, You'll be 36 when you start to feel okay again, and you will never be 35 again, and you will have used up that whole year of being 35 on being brave and noble and fighting the depression, and you won't get it back. And life is really short, and giving up years in this way is not a good thing to do unless you absolutely have to. So I have been very much helped by medication and psychotherapy. Others have been helped by many other things. Medication has to be taken intelligently. It has to be prescribed by people with insight. Different medications work for different people. It's very hard to know what will work for whom. Different psychotherapies work for different people. This is not science. It's art, um, most of it. It's, um, a, it's serious art. But I think that the correct application of those arts allows people to live their lives fully. I tell the story in the book of someone who was a distant acquaintance whom I haven't seen in a long time, and who I saw and who said that she had actually figured out how she could manage not to have depressive episodes in her life. She had given up her career as an artist um, and was doing um, a, a very simple basic work that kept her going. Um, she had broken up with the last of several difficult boyfriends and had decided not to have any romantic relationships again. She had decided not to have children. She had regularized the time when she went to bed and she never went out to a party at night. She had done all of these things which had served as a means of getting herself away from the severe depressive episodes that were so intolerable. And I thought, that's a valid choice. That's how she has chosen to address her depression. And she would clearly like to do that. But I thought, I am not willing, and I think most people should not be willing, to give up all of what constitutes a richly pleasurable life in the service of getting rid of these episodes of terrible pain. And I would rather have a life in which I contain the lows and continue to experience them um, as much as I can. So that's sort of the overall uh, feeling that, um, that I have about it. Now in addition to things like uh, medication and psychotherapy, there are a lot of basic things about lifestyle that one can change. Regularizing your sleep can help a lot. Avoiding alcohol and caffeine can be very helpful. Regular exercise is enormously effective. I actually hate exercising, but I do it as much for my mental as for my physical health. And there is um, uh, convincing evidence that if you take someone who is depressed and does no exercise, and have them do half an hour of intensive exercise every day, that their improvement will be as great as it would be if you started that person on medication and put them on serious medication. So there's a lot to be done, and there's a reason why it's a thick book, and I'm not going to run through everything right now. Most of the people who are in the book uh, are people who were trying to deal with the problem they had. They dealt with it in a variety of ways. 
and contrary to this idea that somehow got into circulation, that it's somehow brave and courageous to face down your oppression by yourself, I thought the real bravery lay in acknowledging the problem, in giving it a name, and in determining to seek out the solutions that would allow a good life to be led despite it. And I thought the people who did that were the ones um, uh, whom I found most compelling, and they're the ones I wrote about. I had always thought of myself as quite a tough and resilient person. And in 1994, um, I published my first novel. And as it came out, uh, I found myself feeling strangely detached from the experience. It didn't seem to be making me very happy, even though I felt it should. And um, as time went on, um, I found that all the ordinary things of my life seemed to be getting more and more difficult. I would think, I really should go out and see people, but it seemed like such an effort to do it. And I would think, oh, there are these things that I ought to be um, accomplishing and achieving, and I lacked energy for it. I could wake up and think, I don't know what I should wear today, and spend half an hour staring at the clothes in my drawer and thinking, um, thinking I don't know. And I just felt myself slow down. I felt as though the kind of pleasure of things was disappearing. And then I would go out and I would come home and I would listen to the messages in my answering machine. And instead of thinking, oh, how fantastic, all of these friends, I want to see everyone, I think it's an awful lot of people that have to call back. And one of the things that gets lost frequently in conversations about depression is that you know while you're experiencing it that it is ridiculous. You know that other people respond to the messages on their answering machine and make themselves lunch and take a shower and get dressed and go out and that they do it without any difficulty at all. And you think to yourself, but how can this have all become so difficult for me? And it was at that point that the acute anxiety began to set in. And I've often said in trying to describe anxiety, I've asked people to imagine that moment when you slip and trip between the time when you slip and the time when you hit the floor, that feeling of being completely out of control. And I think, imagine if that feeling, instead of listening, uh, instead of lasting for one and a half seconds, lasted week after week after week after week. How profound it would be, how terrible it would be to be in that state of out of control fear. And some of the time I felt like I would explode from the fearfulness I felt. And it got worse and worse, and like everyone, I thought, I need to fight this on my own. This is a ridiculous weakness. I need to pull myself together. And I kept trying to pull myself together and trying to function and trying to make it all okay. And finally, I got to the point at which I woke up one day and I thought, I've never felt this bad in my life. And I thought, I should call someone for help. And I lay there in bed and I looked at the telephone for four hours thinking I should pick up the phone and I should make a call. And at the end of four hours, fortunately, the phone rang. And it was my father. And I said to him, there's something wrong with me. I don't know what it is. And he said, I'll be right there. And he came and picked me up. And that was when I began looking um, at treatment and a cure. And like almost everyone, I started on treatment. I didn't like the idea of treatment. I took medication. I was in psychotherapy. I decided I was feeling better. I stopped. I relapsed back into depression. Then I got treatment again, then I stopped, then I relapsed back into depression. So it was a long process climbing my way out. Um, and finally, I had got to the point that I was feeling somewhat better and somewhat better able to function. And I'm a writer, and one of the ways that I have made my way through this whole experience was to take notes on it, some written down, some just in my mind. And I thought, I really need to describe this experience because it's an experience which has too long been walled off in silence. And so uh, I read an article for an American magazine called The New Yorker, in which I described my own experience and talked a little bit about the science around depression. And in the month that that article came out, I received more than 5,000 letters from people writing to say to me, thank you for telling the story, or telling me their stories, or in some other way relating to what I had done. And I thought there's a real need um, uh, to talk about this. There's a real need to lift this heavy, burden of stigma that exists. There's a need to look uh, at the different approaches to depression. And as I looked at books, I found there were some personal memoirs in which people described their own experience. 
there were some medical texts, there were some sociological examinations of the phenomenon, but there was a kind of chaos in the kingdom and nothing that brought it together. And people say, well, but is it a biological problem or is it a psychological problem? Is it a problem of character or is it a problem of neurochemistry? And it seems to me that those are different vocabularies for a single set of phenomena. That you have the experience of depression, of course, there's something going on chemically in your brain, and of course you experience it in emotional terms as a set of emotions and in a way a set of ideas. And I wanted to demystify that, and I wanted to reduce this terrible burden of stigma, which I know exists quite powerfully in this society. It exists in um, all societies, it seems. My experience is that people think that they have this depression and that they can't tell anyone because it's so shameful. Depression is a difficult, exhausting, overwhelming experience. Keeping secrets is a difficult, overwhelming, exhausting experience. Forcing yourself, when you have depression, to keep the secret in addition to dealing with the symptoms of the illness only makes it worse and harder for everyone. So it became a mission for me to try around the world to broaden the conversation. Now also, as I started the book, I had two other central purposes. One was to break down the idea of depression as a modern Western middle class illness by showing that Hippocrates described depression in almost exactly the same way that we would 2,500 years ago, and that there's a long history of people experiencing and writing about it. Um, I wanted to um, show that it is um, not bonded culturally, that there is depression. I looked at depression among survivors of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. I looked at depression uh, among the Greenlandic Inuit. And I looked at the tribal rituals for the treatment of depression in Senegal. And then I went and looked at the problem of depression among the very poor. Very poor people are less likely to self-identify as depressed, but they're not less likely to have depression. Depression comes from the intersection of a biological vulnerability and stressors. And the stressors are going to be more frequent for people who are poor. And the biological vulnerability exists across the entire population. So that was one piece. And the other piece was to try to examine what I found as I began my research, which was that some people had what sounded as they described it, like relatively mild depression, but were nonetheless completely disabled by it. While other people had what sounded as they described it, like much more acute depression, but somehow have rich and meaningful lives, at least in the gaps between their depressive episodes. And I wanted to understand what the mechanisms were that allowed some people to be so much more resilient than others. And what I found, rather ironically, was that the people who had a depression and then never wanted to think about it again and never wanted to talk about it again were the ones who were most crippled by the depression they'd had. In closing it out and hiding from it and walling it off, they became more vulnerable to it and more likely to have recurrences and relapses. And that the people who were willing to say, I would not have sought this experience, but it is part of my life, and I'm going to have a life that incorporates it, and I'm going to think about it and examine it and look at it, those were the people who by and large functioned best of all. And so I wanted to look at the practice through which people develop those dedications. Um, and as I looked, I looked at many different ways of treating depression. I looked at many different attitudes toward depression. I looked at the problem of people who say, I want to get better on my own, as I did. And I now say to people who tell me that, I say, perhaps you will find it on your own, and you'll be better in a year. But you're 37 years old right now, and in a year you'll be 38, and you will never get to be 37 again. And this is a terrible illness, it's not a flaw of character, and it's by and large a relatively treatable illness. There's some resistant depression, but most depression responds to treatment. And if you can treat it, you can have that year of being 37, and life is short, and you shouldn't miss it. So that's sort of the mission with which I came out with the book. I have a friend who is Taiwanese, who looked at the complex character Taiwanese edition, the um, simplified character mainland Chinese edition, and the Japanese edition, because she's fluent in all three. And she said, in Japanese, you've written a book of poetry. In Taiwan, you've written a medical textbook. And 
in mainland China, something halfway in between. So <laughs> there's a real sense that um, I don't know exactly what happens with the translations. But having said that, um, I have an enormous amount of correspondence that comes in now from people um, all over the world. Some of whom have said, you described what I had experienced, and I didn't know anyone else had ever felt that way, and that helped. And some of which say, you described what I had experienced, which I can't describe myself so well, so I gave your book to my husband, my wife, my children, my doctor, my whoever it is, um, who were around them. Um, I, of course, hoped that the book would succeed, but I didn't have any sense when I was writing it quite how um, hungry uh, the world was for, um, for this information. And um, I would like to think that it has helped people to, um, uh, to propel them toward treatment and helped our society to stop judging people uh, for having these vulnerabilities and instead um, allow people to admire those who in the face of the terror and the horror that can be depression, manage to go on with their lives, to get up every day, to do the basic things that they need.